Today we're going to install the Elm Binding and Maple Purfling on this acoustic guitar build. I'm Jeff and you're watching Home Built Workshop. What's going on everyone? Welcome to this episode of Home Built Workshop where we are once again working on the acoustic guitar. In the last episode, if you haven't seen it, there's a link in the description, I kind of left things hanging. And by that, I mean the edges of the top and the back. The box is completely closed but I have yet to trim off this excess material that's overhanging the sides. That's what we need to start working on first thing. Now when we're routing this flush with a flush trim bit and a handheld router, there's a couple things we really need to pay attention to. Well, I guess mainly one, and that's grain direction. If we were to just fire up the router and start making passes all in one direction, there's a really high possibility that we could get some nasty tear out because we're gonna go from different grain directions as we move around the body. One area in particular that we really need to be careful about is right here in the waist, and that's where routing one way, we're going with the grain, and then we switch directions, and we're going against the grain. So to hopefully help reduce the chances of tear out in the waist, I'm gonna take a razor saw and just make a cut through that overhanging material down to the depth where it meets the side. By making that little cut, it kind of gives us a tiny bit of leeway when we're routing in the waist. We're always gonna be routing downhill, but that cut is gonna be our stopping point. And if something were to catch, hopefully that cut will stop the tear out right there. Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. To give the body a little bit more weight during the routing process, I'm going to temporarily load it back into the mold just so it's a little heavier and doesn't end up flying around the shop. In my trim router, I've got almost a brand new flush trim router bit. In fact, this is the bit that I purchased specifically to do this exact process on the first acoustic guitar. I intentionally have not used it for anything other than that. So really, all this router bit's ever done is trimmed a top and a back on one guitar. So virtually brand new. I've double checked the blades. Everything looks good. So let's fire this thing up and very carefully route the top and the back flush with the sides. Eyes and ears, don't be scared. I say don't be scared, but yet I'm a little bit terrified. <laughs> let's go for it. That worked great. Now, we'll just flip this thing over. Reposition everything in the mold and do that exact same thing to the back. Top and back are routed flush. Next up is the binding and purfling channels, but before we do that, we gotta sand these sides. The reason we wanna sand the sides before cutting the binding channels is because the binding cutter references off the sides. So if our sides are a little out of shape, that out of shapeness, is that a word? Is going to translate into the binding channel. So I need to clean up this mess, and then we gotta sand everything nice and smooth. I'm starting out with just a round sanding block. You can't get a whole lot simpler than this. This is just a heavy cardboard tube. 
probably came on, I don't know, a roll of gift wrap or something like that. I just 3D printed a couple of little caps in the end to keep it from collapsing. Stuck some double stick tape on there. It works great, especially for this little area here in the waist. You don't need super fancy sanding blocks. I think that'll work. With all that fun sanding complete, we can now work on cutting the binding and the purfling channels. I've got my purfling and binding right here. I made this up a little while back myself. The binding is gonna be made from this elm and the purfling around the top is gonna to be maple. Should give a nice contrast in color to the maple on the rest of this guitar. I've got my binding tower set up and I've done a bunch of testing, getting everything set correctly. I've now got the binding channels cutting the size that I need to be. Everything's nice and square. Now, I spent a ton of time doing this because I was fighting an issue. Maybe it'll be helpful if I walk you through the issue that I was having. I think I got it figured out and it was really kind of just a silly mistake, but it caused me about an entire afternoon of troubleshooting trying to figure out what was going on. Now my test piece for setting this all up was this little scrap of 2x4. Now on its own it's not tall enough to reach the cutter because the guitar body is much taller than that. This cutter doesn't go all the way down to the height of this 2x4. So in order to raise this up I just grabbed my shooting board and some other things just to space it up so that I could pass it under the binding jig. Now when I set this up I had this shooting board flipped over and what I did not realize was that this cleat is thicker than this thickness of plywood that I had it sitting on. So that was raising up one side of this board. It wasn't quite enough that I immediately noticed it. I just set out to adjust all of these cutters and everything. And the problem I was having was my binding channel was not square. I spent a ton of time resurfacing this binding to make sure that it was square, but it still rocked in the binding channel and I could not figure out why. I checked square on my binding jig, I checked square on the bit, everything, and spent an entire afternoon trying to figure out what was going on. After getting frustrated enough, I finally just left the shop. I, I couldn't figure out what was going on and I was about ready to pull my hair out and I don't have much of that to pull out. The next morning I was fortunate enough to be able to brainstorm with an awesome bunch of people in my weekly live streams and got some more ideas and did some more digging and checking. Finally, I discovered that this cleat on my shooting board was face down, resting on my work table, which was holding everything at an angle. It wasn't much, but it was enough that the binding channel was not square. Once I figured that out, did another test cut, everything's nice and square, everything fits good, and now, I think we're ready to start cutting the binding channels on the guitar body. I don't know how helpful that is, but I wanted to share one of the challenges that I encountered and tell you what the solution was, even though it was quite simple. But, <laughs> but it cost me a lot of time trying to figure that out. But now I know, make sure everything's sitting nice and flat before you do your test cuts. Before I cut the binding channels, I'm gonna seal the edges with a couple of coats of shellac. This will hopefully help prevent tear out. With the body loaded into the jig, we need to make sure that it's level while we make these cuts. So I'll level that up real quick using a ruler to measure the heights at all four corners. This is a pretty important step because if the body is sitting crooked, there's a chance we could get an angled binding channel. And that would be bad. I already spent enough time troubleshooting that kind of issue. I've got the body leveled up in the jig. I've got the purfling cutter set in the router. When I'm making all of these cuts, I'm gonna do it exactly like I trimmed the top. We're always gonna cut downhill, so I'm gonna stop, reposition the guitar body until I get all of the downhill cuts made. Then I can make one pass all the way around and clean everything up. Then I'll swap this out for the binding bit. We'll cut the binding channel on the top, flip the body over, cut the binding channel on the back with the exact same setup. Easy as that, right? No reason to be scared. <laughs> Let's do this.
Let's test this out and make sure the purfling fits like we need it to. That feels perfect. The purfling is just proud of the top, which is exactly where I want it. Now I'll change out that cutter real quick and we'll cut the binding channel. After cutting these channels, I was left with just a few small fuzzies in the channel that could potentially keep the binding from sitting flush. So I want to remove those carefully using a light touch with a file. When I glue in the binding, I plan to use thin CA glue. Now there's a chance that some of this CA glue could wick up into this end grain of this cedar and potentially stain it. So hopefully to help eliminate some of that, I'm going to just spray on another light coat of shellac to kind of seal up those binding channels. Now we can just set this guy aside. We'll let that shellac dry while we set up the bender to bend the binding. And just like that, I've got the bender set up. I've got my heating blanket ready to go. Bindings all laid out. Aluminum foil. I got all of it ready to go. This process is really just gonna be exactly the same as bending the sides. We're going to wet down the binding, wrap it up in the foil, make the sandwich with our slats and our blanket and bend it up. So let's quit yakking and get to bending. To make sure I bend these all in about the same place, I'm gonna line up one edge and then use some blue painter's tape to tape it all together. This will keep one end aligned while we bend it. Now we'll spritz down the pieces with our spray bottle of water, we'll wipe off some of the excess water, and then we can begin building our little foil pack of binding. Wrapping it up in the foil helps seal in the moisture and creates a little bit of steam which helps bend the wood. Now our binding foil pack gets sandwiched between our two pieces of spring steel. I'm aligning the foil pack with one edge of the steel. This gives me a flat reference surface so that nothing is crooked when we load it into the bender. Since we used this last, I did extend the length of this cable. That way it doesn't get really tight right there and have to bend this down. Added about, I don't know, 14 inches or so to that. Should be plenty of extra. Here we go. As the blanket begins heating up, I'm going to do my best to try to monitor the temperature. I don't want these pieces to get too hot or we risk scorching the wood. Starting to hear the sizzle. Oh look, there's some dust burning off too. As everything is coming up to temperature, I'll slowly start to add some pressure to the waste area first. When the waste is fully clamped down, I'll switch off the heating blanket and then finish making these bends. This time I'll hook this thing in the right spot. I left this side of the binding a little too long. So I'm just going to put a couple blocks under there real quick to kind of raise this whole thing up. A little weird, but hey, <laughs> you got to make do when you got to make do, right? It's evening here now, so I'm just going to let this sit just like this overnight. Tomorrow, We'll take a look at it and hopefully we can get everything glued in place. I wonder how many of these pieces have cracked or broken. 
If you want to leave a guess, pause the video, leave a comment, let me know your guess. I think I made seven of these. That way I have a few extras. Let me know if you think any of them did. Hopefully none did. I didn't hear any weird sounds, but we'll find out in the morning. And it's about to be morning for you, just like this. Don't you just love those TV tricks? It's the next morning. Let's unclamp this thing. Perfectly cool. It's set in here overnight. The only thing I did was remove the clamp here and just clamped on a little flat piece of wood. I didn't want the dowels overnight to possibly dent the binding. I don't know if that would have happened or not, but to make sure it didn't, I just replaced this. Let's see how many of these broke. Before we unwrap this, my guess is going to be one. What's yours? All right, let's see what we have. After a quick inspection, I would say I was wrong. If you guessed zero, you would be correct. I don't see any cracks, any splits, or anything in here. There's even one that has what almost looks like a little knot right on the edge. I thought for sure that that would crack, but it didn't. These look awesome. First, I'll roughly fit the binding in place. That way I can mark off where I need to cut the ends. When I cut this off, I'm leaving it just a little bit long. That way we can fine tune it once we have the binding in place. There's something kind of fun about this process, although it does take a little bit of time and it is kind of tedious, but it's kind of fun to see everything start to fall into place. When I get down to the end of the lower bout where the two pieces of binding meet, I'm going to use a chisel to pare away some of the excess material, still staying slightly outside of my line. Then I'll use a small sanding block to fine tune that fit. At the neck end of the binding, I'm not going to worry about trying to be so precise because that area is going to be covered by the neck anyway. With the binding all taped up, I'm ready to wick in some thin super glue. I've got a block of wood handy just in case I need to press in a couple of areas. If I run into that sort of situation, then I'll give it a quick shot of accelerator to get that glue to dry really quick. Otherwise, I'm gonna try to avoid using accelerator as much as possible, just so that it doesn't foam and bubble up. I want a nice clean glue joint and letting it dry naturally is really the best way to get that. I've got a piece of parchment paper I'm gonna try to keep near the area where I'm working. That way I can try to prevent any drips from getting on the top. Another good reason to have a little bit of shellac on there will be also to prevent some of that, but I'm gonna try to catch any drips that may or may not occur with the parchment paper. I'm using a whip tip on the end of my CA glue to give me a very small amount of glue at a time. I don't want a giant amount to come pouring out and spill all over everything. The whip tip allows me to be very precise with the amount of glue that comes out. Most of the time, you have to be a little bit careful still. I'm gonna give this a few minutes to dry and then I'll repeat the exact same process on the back. The back's gonna be a lot easier because I don't have to mess with the purfling as well. It's just a couple pieces of binding. That process is gonna look exactly like this so I'll spare you the repetitiveness of gluing on that binding as well. We'll be right back with all of the binding installed. With all of the binding securely glued in place now begins the fun task of, yeah, more sanding. Since the binding is proud on both the top as well as the sides, we need to sand all of it perfectly flush with the body. As I'm sanding, my goal is to really only sand the binding until it's exactly flush. I don't want to do too much more sanding on the body itself. This just takes some time and some patience, 
as I'm trying to avoid using a powered sander like my random orbit sander. Although that's an option if you're really careful with it. To play it safe though, I'm gonna try to stick with hand sanding. You're not much help. You need opposable thumbs. And then you could sand this for me. As I'm using this little cardboard sanding tube block thing, I wanted to make a quick correction. I think earlier I mentioned this was from something like gift wrap. It was actually not from gift wrap. Most gift wrap tubes are pretty flimsy. It's actually made out of one of these heavy cardboard shipping tubes. This came with some parts not long ago and it reminded me what I used to make this from. So if you order parts and it has one of these cardboard tubes, they make pretty good sanding blocks. After what feels like an eternity of sanding, our binding's level, nice and smooth, and we're at the point where we can now set this body aside and start working on the neck. Just for fun, let's give this a quick wipe down with some mineral spirits and just get an idea of what this might look like once we apply some finish. That maple purfling really gives it a nice contrast. This is gonna look really cool. I love the darker color of the elm against both the maple sides and the Port Orford cedar top. This is gonna be awesome. Just for fun, I wiped some mineral spirits around the rosette as well. Like that dark brown color of the elm and the white maple purfling. I'm quite happy to be at the step where I can set the body aside and begin working on something different for a change. We're gonna start on the neck in the next episode of the Acoustic Guitar Build. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss when that video comes out. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time. I like it.